yeah, thank you for agreeing to, to meet me on on, uh, on this boat in the yeah. middle of the woods. Pleasure to be on a boat in the woods. It's kind of mad, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I like the fact that today you've got the sound of the the wind in the trees, and there's that sort of nice relationship between the wind and the trees and the, the ocean. Also. Yeah. You can hear the waves. Yeah, you can always pretend it's kind of waves on the cobbles <laughs> or something. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, on the sand. I get awfully seasick, so actually, <laughs> this is my ideal boating experience. <laughs> so that's why you've done it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. Um, so, tell me about your, your research. So, you're based in Exeter, aren't you? That's right. So, I'm a lecturer in Exeter. I spend quite a lot of my time teaching the bright young things of tomorrow, lots of undergraduate teaching, a few masters and PhD students. Um, but I also focus on research, particularly now during the summer when we are, we're relieved of teaching. So I work um, in two main areas. The first area is um, thinking about the acoustics of the ocean, thinking about, uh, first of all, how animals use all the natural acoustic information available to them. And then secondly, thinking about how we're modifying that acoustic environment. Okay. So just to unpick that slightly, hmm. the natural acoustics, if you live in the, if you live in the deep ocean, yep. acoustics is one of the most valuable cues you could ever use because sound travels very fast underwater, hmm. five times faster than in air. Okay, because it's it, denser? Because it's denser, the water is very dense, so it propagates sound really well. Yep. And it travels for tens, hundreds, thousands of kilometres. Wow, so, so why does it travel so far? Um, because of the density of the oh, water, okay. so yeah. it really it it, uh, it transfers acoustic energy yeah. with very little loss of energy as, it, as it propagates. Huh. So sound is is everywhere in the ocean. Um, even if you don't live in the deep ocean, you might live say on a coral reef. Half of your life it's still dark because it's night time. Yeah. So we tend to look at the ocean during the daytime and we see it as this beautiful bright blue or colourful environment. Reality is that it's actually a very scary, dark world, huh. even for those very shallow water animals. So sound has become, over evolutionary time, one of the key cues that they use for many different uh, functions in their life. So some animals can communicate using sound, fish can vocalise, whales and dolphins produce a whole range of sounds, um, even some invertebrates. Um, you know, lobster can play their antennae almost like a fiddle. Really? Um, urchins scrape away. There's lots of noise. It's ah. natural. Um, and some of that is animals communicating with each other. Yeah. As some of it then is um, incidental noise, so the sound of animals either being chased or chasing or eating or chomping. When a parrotfish chomps on the reef, you really hear it from you yeah. know, 20 metres away when you're, when you're snorkeling. And you've actually been there and heard these so, sounds. So we've spent a lot of time recording these sounds. Right. Now the reason that I got interested in this was initially I was um, working with a group trying to develop ways of managing coral reef fisheries in the third world, in the developing world. And we realised that there was very little understanding about the life of coral reef fish. We know that they live as adults on reefs, we know that that's where fishermen catch them. But early in the life of these fish they go out to sea, they develop in the larval um, planktonic stage, so they're almost microscopic. Yeah. And at some, somehow they find their, their way onto reefs. So we were really puzzled as to how they could do this. People worked on the sense of smell and that seems to be important. Hmm. But we started taking the recordings of coral reefs, playing them back to our little larval fish and found that many of them were attracted by the sounds. And as we've developed this work uh, further, we've realised that fish can tell different types of habitats so they can listen into to their, yeah. their, their community, pick the place that they'd like to go and uh, settle to and live their adult life before having to try and take on all the predators that are waiting to intercept them. So sound, we realised, was a really important part of the life of animals. Yeah. We, yeah. And then, and then, of course, we come along with our yeah, that's right, with our machinery. So we don't have any recordings of the ocean before the industrial revolution. Right. Obviously, um, it was really only during the war that people started listening to the ocean, mainly listening to submarines. Okay. Um, but when we, when we look at the, the way that the sound has changed, we look at the amount of uh, human noise, we call yeah. it anthropogenic noise, produced by humans in the ocean, relative to all of the natural noise, we realise the oceans have got about 100 times louder huh. over the last 150 years. If a, if a boat's going along the surface, how far does the sound of the engine sort of propagate yeah. down? Does it, can it travel? 
Uh, to the bottom of the seabed, you know, yeah, a kilometre? Yeah, for sure. So, ah. so, so, I mean, sometimes when we're scuba diving, you know, you, you suddenly hear this juggernaut and it's the sound of a ship and you feel like it's overhead. And then you surface and look around and there's a dot on the horizon no. and that's a ship that's just come around, <laughs> come around the headland. So that's you feeling the sound, say, 10 kilometres away. So what effect would that have then on, yeah, on, on the ocean life? So, 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 so certainly, yeah. Tankers and... Yeah, for animals that have very sensitive hearing, blue whales are a good example, it must be hugely frustrating to start with because their hearing is so sensitive, it's said that they can hear a ship coming towards them for more than a day. Wow. So that's the sort of saps, the range that these ships are producing noise. Mm. Um, for, um, for whales and dolphins, that might mean that they move away. They, they avoid areas that are very noisy, which could be their preferred breeding grounds or yep. feeding grounds. Um, we work with fish and invertebrates, looking at how sound can interfere with their lives. Is there any evidence to, to suggest that whales are getting louder? In terms of their vocalisation? Yeah. So yeah, we've actually Try been looking quite a lot about it. That's called the Lombard effect, where yeah. in a noisy environment you shout basically. Yeah. So that's one thing that we do see, but people study killer whales more than blue whales because they're easier to find and easier to study. Um, so some killer whales do uh, produce louder sounds or they uh, call during the quiet windows. So if there's lots of passing boats, they wait for the boats to pass and then do the vocalisation. They can modify the frequencies. So if there's lots of deep noises, then they start singing a bit oh, higher that's right. to try and find the quiet yeah. part of the sound spectrum that they can communicate. That's kind of crazy. So, so things like offshore wind farms, then mm. that's going to have an impact, isn't it, on, on the acoustic yeah. environment? So that's one of the main areas that we work on in the UK. Um, the UK is ideally located yeah. for offshore renewable energy. And you know, I think all of us who work in the marine environment think that that's an important part of the future um, to try and get ourselves off uh, oil and gas. Yeah. But when you build a wind farm, then if you flown over the North Sea and seen the wind farms, they go as far as you can see in, in both directions. Wow. And these are um, turbines that have been put onto single struts that have been banged into the seabed. Yeah. So just the sound yeah. of that banging. It's called pile driving, that's yeah. right. You know, but these, these piles might be 10 metres across with walls about this thick. Holy crap. So they really do take a lot of banging, thousands and thousands of bangs to get them into the seabed. Yeah. And that sound travels for 50 kilometres, 100 kilometres. So that is just, yeah. That's so has an, has an impact. Yeah, but then the you would you would think it would be better to produce less carbon dioxide emissions through burning coal. Uh, you know, it'd be better to have offshore wind farms compared to the the effect of all that carbon dioxide being Absolutely. thrown up and then absorbed into the sea in that direction. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with that. So so and and the difficult thing that we have with carbon dioxide is that it leaves a legacy. And yep. that legacy is likely to be around for centuries and centuries, even if we stop burning coal and gas mm. and oil. The difference with noise as a pollutant is that we have complete control over it. Yes. And the moment we stop banging, the noise goes. Yes, that's so true. we've got a lot more control over noise as mm. a pollutant. And that's why you know, there's been some really innovative ways of trying to control noise, um, including you can, you can put a bubble curtain around your pile, so that's a hose pipe blowing up bubbles. No, of bubbles, does that work? And it insulates the noise. That's the sound mad. doesn't go from water to air very well. <laughs> so you can insulate your sound inside a bubble curtain. You can obviously choose not to pile drive, say, during a breeding season. Right. Um, the Germans do that with their herring spawning grounds. They just say we're not going to build wind farms during these months. So it can be a real benefit to the, yeah. fish, to the fisheries, actually, to, to, to take this information on board. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is really good, yeah. sort of solid um, yeah, effects of your research that you're doing. Yeah. And actually, it's an implementation of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so a lot of it's now seeing its way into policy, seeing its way into European law in ways that we deal with noise and just manage it. You know, We need to make noise in the ocean but we can do it smart, we can do it in a smart way yeah. to try and minimise the impact. Yeah. I'm very impressed. Okay, yeah, that's so very that's, cool. So that's kind of today's <laughs> problem, you know, it's not the only problem, but mm. you know, we feel that if we can deal with some of these problems of today, like noise, we give the environment a bit more spare capacity yeah. to deal with the bigger long-term uh, problems that we're predicting for the future. That's amazing, mm. that's amazing. So what would you like to, to, to change, you know, how do you see this moving forward over the next sort of 10 years. I suppose you're, what you're, you're saying is actually we need to take more consideration of the, the acoustics of, yeah, 
perhaps it, uh, wind turbines being put in and oil rigs and goodness yeah. knows what else. Those, those really loud. Are those the sort of loudest emitters of yeah, sound? Yeah, I mean, is shipping is probably the, the dominant amount, uh, dominant noise in the ocean, mm. just because there's so many ships. But the nice thing with shipping is that you can move a shipping lane. Or you can just change the engine slightly, you can change the propeller design. Yeah, that's interesting. So there are modifications that International Maritime Organization manage global shipping. Yep. And they're really switched on to the impacts of noise and looking for ways that they can incentivize their mm. shipping fleets to change, to, to reduce the, the noise they produce. Which yeah. is what the, what's sort of happening in um, the aeronautical industry as well, isn't it? Exactly. Like Airbus, you know, yeah. just uh, trying to make quieter aeroplanes. Yeah. So are there any crossovers in engineering perhaps between the two? There are definitely. I mean, ah. certainly certainly, we talk to some of the big engineering companies who have ideas about ways you could change the pitch of the blades on the propeller. Yeah. Because a lot of the noise is cavitation around the propeller yeah. as it's working quite inefficiently um, at high speed. Yeah. So thinking of ways of improving efficiency, which then means they use less fuel and, you know, it has ah. lots of clever knock-on yeah. links. That's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. And. Um, so, moving on to your other field of interest, because mm. it's interesting, you've got these two areas of, of research that you're yeah. doing, which is quite unusual, I think, for, for scientists. Um, so tell me about the next field of, of uh, the research that you've been sort of um, giving your attention over the last few years. Yeah, so, I, uh, so certainly when you work in marine biology, you talk about climate change a yep. lot. And although at the time I was working with, with noise, it was today's problem and it was a lot of quite nice natural history, it wasn't the big problem that mm -hmm. people were, were really starting to, uh, to worry about, I guess. A lot of the big names in marine biology were you know, really starting to ring the bell and saying, this is, this is you know, we've passed the point of no return. Yeah. I think you know, there's now a new breed of scientists, younger generation, who are starting to think well, more optimistically, what can we do in our lifetimes to try and turn things around a bit? Right. Um, I've always been a keen fisherman, so I've always been interested in, in um, uh, the ways that both industrially, people on fishing boats are sampling the, the, the marine ecosystem, and the way that recreational fishermen are out there sampling. You see records these days of more and more exotic species being caught in Devon and Cornwall. Huh. So I think probably bringing some of my work close to home, I started thinking about fisheries and thinking about the fact that our world was warming. And it didn't take long before I realised that we had an ideal opportunity in the UK and in Europe to study the effects of climate change on fisheries. Right. And that's for two reasons. One is that we, because we're part of the common fisheries policy in Europe, we sample the fisheries as scientists every year in a very repeated way. Right. We've got high resolution data over many decades. And that's to measure the, the, the type of fish, but also the amount of fish. Yeah, that's it? right. So, so to, to monitor the stocks and to, to come up with quota that might be then um, ignored, by ignored by or manipulated <laughs> slightly, certainly. <laughs> but at least it gives some guide as to yeah. how, whether we think a stock is improving or, or declining. Yeah. Okay, but that's the sort of sci fishery science that has been going on for decades. What we also realised when we looked at the sea temperature record is that because the North Sea, the Irish Sea, the Channel are all quite enclosed seas and are very shallow, yeah. because we're on this big kind of uh, uh, a big um, platform of a continental shelf that mm. the UK sits on reaching out into the Atlantic. Yeah. The waters in a, around the UK have been warming much more rapidly than the global average. Oh, that's interesting. So, I so didn't know that. About four times the global average. So about wow. two degrees over the last 30 years. No, really? Yeah. As much as that? So that's really, I mean, it sounds great if you like surfing or swimming or, or whatever. But that's, an that's two a degrees. huge difference. And is that through climate change? So they, it's possible that some of it isn't due to climate change. There are these long-term decadal cycles, right. multi-decadal cycles. But I think certainly scientists are all very sure now that the humans, uh, human influence on the environment has changed global temperatures both in the I know, atmosphere but a two and degree in the change in sea around the UK yeah. is an extraordinary so, figure. So the warming is really hitting the mid-latitude um, uh, areas of the world, of which obviously the UK and Northern Europe sits yep. within that area. Um, the Northern Hemisphere is warming more than the Southern Hemisphere because of the amount of land relative to water. Oh, okay. So we're just ideally placed. Uh, yep. People have described the North Sea as a cauldron of climate change. Right. Which, which is quite an, you know, it's quite exciting in that we, on our doorstep, have this great 
experimental model. <laughs> it that, is exciting, but in a kind yeah, of in a, a, in a worrying way. way. <laughs> in a worrying way. Um, but it's also an area that we've been sampling for the last thirty years. Okay, so you've got that sampling. So, we're so what to have really you discovered? Drill into what that. have you yeah. discovered? So what we have discovered is that when we look at the distributions of different species, we see warmer water species moving up the continental shelf from North Africa, the Bay of Biscay, Portugal, yeah. moving up and into the Channel, through the Celtic Sea around Ireland and into the North Sea. So what sort of species are we talking about? So these would be species like red mullet, John Dory, squid, cuttlefish, okay. uh, sardines. Yeah, the sort of fish that you really yeah. enjoy when you're in Spain. That's right, the sort of fish. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So I'll come back to that in a minute. So those are the fish that you will um, increasingly see in the certainly in the southwest now, they dominate the fishery. Right. Um, if you go, if you then look at the colder water species, so things like cod and haddock and whiting and all the things that our grandparents ate as the great British fish, yeah. they've been moving further and further north. Right. Uh, they've also been moving into deeper water to try and yeah, keep them there cool. in the right temperatures. That's right, because fish are cold-blooded, so they're totally at the mercy of the temperature of the water. Wow. So two degrees of warming is a difference say on a hot day of having to put on a jumper and wear, walk around all day in a jumper or not, mm. you know, it's, it makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference and will yeah. it affect the, uh, the population development and things yeah. like that? Yeah, so, so, perhaps, so this, or? exactly, the temperatures directly affect when fish spawn. Right. It affects um, the, um, the fecundity, how many eggs that they're producing, the rate that the eggs mature, mm. uh, and then obviously because the, when they produce all their eggs, their larvae, again grow up in planktonic water they have to feed and so if they've been laid too early they miss the plankton bloom of spring oh, cool. so there's we call it a match mismatch where suddenly the the fish are there but there's nothing to You're eat in the wrong start place. the wrong yes. place at the wrong, wrong time. time that's right mm. <laughs> so there are lots of real knock-on effects which is why we're seeing these pop species moving um the uh, i guess the other thing we've been then doing is starting to use the last 30 years of data to develop models that allow us to predict into the future. So not just looking back at climate change. Okay, so you could say we're moving up yeah. the, 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 into the North Sea. Yeah. So what's the, what are the predictions then over the next sort of 30 yeah. years? So, so our prediction, I guess, or when we started the work, was really to try and work out where would uh, Place have got to, where would Dab have got to, where would John Dory have got to. Yeah. And that was using a fairly standard approach where you look at the temperatures that a species likes yeah. and then work out where those temperatures will be in the future. Mm. And people have been doing that for a while. What we realised, because our models included things like the depth that the species live at, the habitat that they live in, was that although the temperatures keep moving north, the habitat stays where it is. So if you're a flatfish, say, yeah. imagine you're a place or oh, okay so a you soil. need a specific yeah you're living in the southern north sea you like it to be shallow muddy you feed on worms maybe a few small crabs yeah and that's your temperature as the temperatures warm you start to move northwards but the north sea gets deeper and rockier mm -hmm. and and the habitat that you require so, runs out oh god so although it looks from the surface like the sea goes on all the way up yeah, to the yeah. arctic you're effectively pushed off the edge of a cliff so so the species is in decline for those particular species that, yeah, so that need that particular habitat. Our prediction certainly for, for well, for the eight... They can't adapt quick enough. They can't sort of uh, start swimming in a different yeah, way. Yeah, well, I mean, we don't know that. <laughs> we don't, I, we are, we're having to assume that the fish can't adapt quickly enough because it's hard to model how adaptation might happen. Yeah. It's possible for some species that they will adapt if they tend to be, say, fairly general about the habitats they require, the diet is broad, things like that. Um, but waiting in the wings are a whole bunch of species that are already adapted to those conditions. Right. So they've not only got to adapt, they've got to act, continue to outcompete species that might be better suited to those, right. those yeah, environments. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, the real all, challenge. Yeah, that's so right. Get squished. So some will carry on moving. Cod, haddock will carry on moving north, north to Norway, Iceland, although already that's happened. We haven't really noticed as a consumer that most of the cod that we eat now is imported from No, no, the fish north. fingers are still the same shape. The same shape, <laughs> fish and chips, cod and chips, you get in your yeah, local fish and chips. But it's coming from further and further north. So 70% of our cod is now imported. Um, you know, and, I, and we mentioned the fish that you might eat in Spain on holiday. Yeah. They're having to buy their fish in Spain from the UK. 
So all the fish we, we eat, we import, That's kind of and mad. the fish we catch, we have to export. So what fish are they having in Spain? Are they getting fish from Africa now? So yeah, that's right. They they I mean they have huge sardine festivals and things like that. Lots of uh, horse mackerel and mm. you know almost subtropical species. But um, we do, but I mean a hundred years ago we used to have big sardine festivals, didn't we? But yeah. we just sort of fished them all out. Yeah. So yeah. So well. We, we've certainly fished out herring. Herring and sardine have kind of been interchanged through history. I mean, right, yeah. And the herring is the cold water equivalent of the warm water sardine. Oh, okay. So they've tended to be moving back and forth a bit through the channel, mm. uh, depending on the water temperatures. Um, we really did outfish herring. And there's now, there's been quite a, a North Sea moratorium on herring, and it's starting to recover quite well. Okay. So people have done a good job with recovering herring, but it won't come back down through the channel in the way mm. that it was once. Um, here because it's too warm. Amazing. Yeah. Crikey. So um, what would you like to see change then? I mean if we've had a two degree shift over the last 30 years in, mm. in, the, in the temperature of the oceans around the UK, mm. are you expecting another two degrees and and you know yeah. what, what would you like to happen over the next 30 years that would yeah. give you a sense of kind yeah. of the, a feeling that we're on the right Some path? Progress. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd like to say that it's only likely to be two degrees. The predictions are probably nearer to three or four degrees warming over the next 35 years. So we are going to carry on warming. Um, obviously, in the long term, we need to do something about our energy budget to try and reduce the amount of oil and gas and, and uh, coal that we're using to produce energy. Um, and I think that really has to hopefully be the real turning point in our lifetimes. Um, without that, it's hard to imagine that things can improve. Do you want to quickly but, to define yeah. the the reason why the sea is, is rising in temperature and yeah. as well? Because obviously, you're emitting all this coal yeah. and yeah. gas and these carbon dioxide emissions. They're going yeah. up into the atmosphere. Yeah. How does that then heat up the oceans? Yeah. So, so I mean, you've you've heard of the greenhouse effect. So, carbon dioxide obviously is bur is produced by burning hydrocarbon energy sources. That uh, carbon dioxide is um, then uh, held in the atmosphere, so we've seen an increase from about 280 parts per million up to um, about 400 now, so 280 to 400, coming up towards a doubling, you know, in another probably 10 years wow. of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. About a third of the carbon dioxide that we've produced by, um, uh, by since the Industrial Revolution has been absorbed into the, the ocean. Right. So that's not including what was in the atmosphere. So that's not changing the temperature. So the that's ocean. changed the chemistry that's, of the ocean. Yeah, and that's the, the ocean acidification element mm. of it. But the CO2 in the atmosphere, so, so the reason I mention that though is that the potential for the ocean to carry on absorbing CO2 mm. is running out. The oh. buffering effect of the ocean is starting to run out. So that's why we expect CO2 levels in the atmosphere to rise quite rapidly. Oh, right. And that means that we produce an ever um, greater greenhouse effect. So yeah. it's, it's really retaining a lot of the heat that is being um, brought in by solar energy. Um, now, because uh, the air is very uh, light, uh, low density, it doesn't hold a lot of heat. Um, and so, m although the, we, we really notice the temperatures of the atmosphere, the heat, the thermal energy that comes from the sun, is almost all ending up in the oceans, right? Um, which is why we're starting to see, say, the thinning of the, Ant uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic ice. Mm. Um, the ocean is increasing in its temperature. When water increases in temperature, obviously it expands, so we see sea level rise as well, both from the melting of ice. Oh, it's also doom and gloom. So that's all real doom and gloom, <laughs> and I don't want to. I don't want to just come across as doom and gloom because I am an optimist, and I do think that certainly the science behind climate change is is you know, fundamentally different to when we were, say, studying uh, the environment at school or at university. Yeah. We really have got a grasp of what needs to be done. Mm. And it's a case now really of waiting for the political juggernaut to catch up. Mm. And I think it will. Um, in terms of what that means um, at a more local scale, so say when I talk about European fisheries, I think we have a lot of opportunity in that the seas will continue to be productive. Um, you know, we that we live on a fertile continent, as it rains a lot of nutrients end up in the ocean, ah. 
uh, upwellings bring uh, nutrients from deep water. So every year we have a very um, impressive plankton bloom. It's very good seeds. Place. Yeah. That's right. So we're in a good part of the world for productive seas. So we're seeing a changing of the garden in terms of which species we find. We'll have increasingly warm water species. But those are species that lend themselves to fishing slightly more intensively because they tend to have short generation times. They reproduce early, they're very fecund. They tend to be lower trophic levels, so they, uh, they're not the high-end predators like cod, say. Okay. That you have to wait for a cod to get to six or seven years if you yeah. really wanted to fish it sustainably. Some of these fish you can fish after two years, yeah. and they've already reproduced and they've been able to eat okay. a fairly broad, broad diet. So that's the good news. So, so, so certainly we anticipate that we could be producing more fish. Yeah. And the the um, World Health Organization predict that we actually need to be producing 50% more fish oh by 2030. <laughs> so that, it, that's unlikely to all come through capture wild fisheries, mm. but I think a, 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 an element of it can do because we, we're managing our fisheries. A lot of the, um, the local fisheries that have historically been overfished, cod for example, is increases, it, it's improving in a really positive way. Oh, so good. fisheries management is definitely yeah. in the best place it's been. And the fishermen are really on board with the science. Scientists are working with the fishermen. The policy makers are starting to understand both sectors. Oh, okay, really so we've turned so the corner. It sounds like we've turned the corner. Yeah, I mean, I guess cynically you could say we hit rock bottom. <laughs> but whichever it was, we're really in a positive place now with good management, um, responsible fishing, and a very informed consumer yeah. making better decisions. Yep. So, so in that sense, I think we can produce more fish, we can do it sustainably, we can mean that the fishing industry is a more lucrative industry for the UK. Yeah, um, no, that makes a lot yeah. more sense. And, uh, you know, if, if fish stocks are allowed to recover, you know, if we're down at 5%, if we just allow them to go up to 50%, it's going to be much easier for, fi for fishermen to go out there and, sure. and, and catch the fish they need and more. Yeah. No, yeah. it's really good. Thank you very much. Okay. Pleasure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice really nice to spend some time on your boat. <laughs>